This next, we have a special drop-in guest. Uh, he's been a marijuana legalization proponent since the early days, man, since even before I was one. Uh, you may know him from the men's warehouse, I guarantee it. He's here for you. He's going to bring up our next speaker. I don't even know if he's looking at me. There he is. Ladies and gentlemen, George Zimmer. Well, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be here with uh, such a distinguished group. Uh, it is my honor to introduce our next speaker, who uh, I'm sure many of you know. Uh, Ethan Nadelman is a guy from New York City that I have known since Prop 215 about uh, 20 years ago. And he's one of the most exceptional guys I've ever encountered. Uh, he went to the same high school I went to about a decade after I did. But then, unlike me, he went to Princeton uh, and became a professor as well at Princeton before George Soros plucked him out of academia and brought him in to work on open society and uh, uh, drug liberalization ideas. Uh, he really is a student of American history. I think that was his uh, subject that he taught at Princeton. And so I would like to remind us all of the great debates in 1787-88, uh, during which time the compromises that led to the creation of the United States were achieved. Not all those compromises were ideal. Uh, the three-fifths uh, 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 concerning slaves led to the Civil War, so there were some real problems. Ethan is going to lay out the foundation for what may very well become the united legalization efforts that we will embark on uh, shortly. So without further ado, let me bring Ethan Edelman up here. Okay. Morning, everybody. For those of you who've been sitting for a while, take a, so I don't want you leaving in the middle of this, so you stand up right now and just stretch out for a moment and, you know, do something with your arms and your legs to get the blood going. And <sighs> Okay, that's enough. So, let me start off by saying this with as high a level of certainty as I can possibly feel confident in, which is we are going to legalize marijuana in California in 2016. We are going to do it, and we're going to do it right. We're going to do it right, OK? That's what's key. California is pivotal. California is pivotal not just because California is the largest state in the country, not just because all eyes are on California, but because Cal California does is going to reverberate nationally and even internationally, right? Now, what that means is that California, you know, it's not just that what you do here is so important. It also means that the way it's done here, the way things work out here, are going to make a big difference for the rest of the country. You know, I mean, and, and so what I want to do here is not give you the specifics of, you know, of, of what DPA and Drug Policy Organization, Drug Policy Alliance, what were, you know, the, the details of this. What I want to talk to you about is the principles that guide us, the principles that drive us, the dilemmas that we're confronting, the issues that we did not anticipate when we first embarked on this journey two decades ago, if not more. It's not going to be full of answers in the nitty-gritty sense. 
It's going to be full of questions and dilemmas that I hope all of you will see, st sort of stop and think about, about what does this really mean. And I'm going to be as frank and honest as I possibly can be. Right? Not an in-your-face, fuck it, take it, leave it this way, and this way it's going to be, but just how it's playing out. The conversations we're having with my colleagues and with my board and with a whole range of other people you know, around California and even outside as well. Now, the first thing I want you to understand about both me and the Drug Policy Alliance is that we are first and foremost a human rights organization. That's what drives us. That's why I got involved in this. That's why I built this organization. That's why I'm doing this thing. And that's why I work round the clock to end the war on drugs in America. This is first and foremost an issue of human rights, of personal sovereignty of our own minds and bodies and our own homes, an issue about the notion that nobody should be discriminated against or among simply, simply upon what they put in their body, a no notion that it is fundamentally wrong to launch a public policy in which people of color, and especially black people, are disproportionately and negatively affected and discriminated against, that that's what drives me. That's what keeps me going, okay? That's what I'm coming from. The second thing I'm going to tell you is that we are not just about marijuana. It's why I was so glad that my friend and board member Carl Hart opened up this conference, right? It's not just about marijuana. And by that, it does, I'm not saying that we think that we should legalize marijuana and legalize all the other drugs in the same way we legalize marijuana, et cetera, et cetera. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that what we are seeking to do is to roll back and end the drug war in America and around the world. Right? That is what we're trying to do. You know, and if you want, if somebody was to say, Ethan, can you define what DPA is about, what the drug policy reform movement's about in one sentence? And you know what the answer is? I can. It's a long sentence. And it's not just about freedom, although freedom is the essence of it. But it's this. If one imagines a spectrum of drug ways of dealing with drugs in our society, from the most punitive, cut off their hands, lock them up, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, what have you, da -da 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 down the spectrum to the most free market, libertarian, no restrictions on anything except sales to kids, you know, Milton Friedman's wet dream, right? I mean, that whole spectrum, right? What we're aiming to do is to reduce the role of criminalization and the criminal justice system in drug control to the maximum extent possible while still protecting and enhancing public health and public safety. It means moving down this spectrum, re-squeezing out the criminalization, the criminal justice players as much as possible, but stopping short at the point where we think that doing so would actually significantly and negatively impact public safety and public health. I am not fighting for the emergence of a new cigarette in American society, and not something that is incredibly addictive and dependent causing, where people don't fully real, realize the harms associated with it, and then it's out there for decades, and then it's locked in. I don't want that. The mission of Drug Policy Alliance is twofold. Our first mission is to reduce and ultimately end the harms of dro drug prohibition, and our second mission is to reduce as much as possible the harms associated with drug use. It's those two missions both. It's not just end prohibition, the hell what happens. It's not just reduce the harms of drugs and try to weave a way of decriminalization into that. It's those are the guiding missions in that. When it comes to Cal look, as George said, I'm a New Yorker. I was born in New York. I've been living the last 20 years. I plan to retire in New York if I ever retire and die in New York, so far as I know. I love New York. It's nice being the center of the universe, okay? I gotta tell you, right? But that said, for Drug Policy Alliance, California has always been our number one priority. Right? From the time we got involved in Prop 215 back in 96, you know, from the time when Marsha Rosenbaum opened up our first branch office in San Francisco in 96 and Dan Abramson opened up our National Legal Affairs office in Berkeley, from the time we opened up in Los Angeles in the early 2000s and opened up in Sacramento then as well, and we haven't just been about marijuana. It hasn't just been about medical and legalization and reducing arrests and decriminalization. It's also been about rolling back and ending the other elements of the harms of the drug war. We were proud. You know, I've got to tell you something. When we, in 96, after we all won Prop 215, and everybody was slamming George Soros and me and others in the Times and Capitol Hill, right? And you know what my, my recommendation to George Soros was the, three months later, when we were all getting attacked like that, and they were saying it's all subterfuge to legalize everything? I said, George, you know what you got to do? Make a very public commitment. One million dollars in funding for needle exchange to reduce the spread of HIV AIDS. 
And he said yes, and he did it. And he became, we became the biggest private funder of needle exchange to reduce HIV AIDS in America in the late 1990s. In 2000, it came time when California's prison population had been growing for decades, and we drafted and wrote and raised the money and won Prop 36, Prop 36, treatment instead of incarceration so that people getting picked up in possession of a drug who had not a big criminal record but an issue you know, with drug addiction could, could not be sent to jail the first couple of times they got busted. And where we allocated $120 million a year for drug treatment for five years and kept that going and ultimately raised a billion dollars for drug treatment, as much as possible outside the criminal justice system, right? If you look at the, uh, California's growth of prisons, you will see that after 2000, all of a sudden, incarceration dropped for a year or two. And then the prison industrial complex got that prison industrial juggernaut back on the rails and they began building it up again. But that's why we got involved in 2004 in an effort to stop the three strikes, to reform the three strikes law. It was a flawed initiative, it was better than the flawed three strikes law, and we would have won that if Henry Nicholas, a right-wing billionaire, hadn't put five million against us at the last moment. It's why we got behind in 2008, in fact, drafted and built Prop 5. My biggest defeat in my life was Proposition 5 in 2008. That would have been the biggest prison reform in the history of the United States, right? That would have reduced the California prison population by 25 to 35,000 people. It would have shifted a billion dollars a year from prison and parole to treatment and rehabilitation. It would have held the entire Department of Corrections accountable by, other, by, by the standards that we care about. It basically wove together all the best recommendations from every commission that had looked at prisons and sentencing in California and wove them together in one initiative. We were up two to ones in the poll going in. I raised seven and a half million dollars of hard money from people around the country. Nobody had ever raised that kind of money for criminal justice reform, marijuana reform. You guys think that's easy? Go ahead and try it. Go ahead and try it. Raising money from people on the left and the right who care about nothing except trying to reduce incarceration. And in the last two months, the California prison industrial complex, the prison guards union, the political establishment across the spectrum ganged up and they slaughtered us. They slaughtered us. That was my biggest defeat. But we worked hard to reduce incarceration in this country. That initiative had almost nothing to do about marijuana, but it was about ending the criminalization and demonization of other people in the state. It's why in 2010, when Richard Lee put together the initiative to legalize marijuana and other national organizations were saying, we don't want to help you, you know, wait till 2012, more young people show up. I called Richard, I said, if you're determined to go, I'd rather you wait till 2012, but we will help you. And it means that after Richard put in his money, we led the effort, led the effort to raise the most of the rest of the, most of the rest of that money for that campaign to do the national media. And I will say this about Richard Lee's effort and the initiative in 2010. Am I talking too fast, by the way? <laughs> I know, you know, you're not New Yorkers here, right? But I will say this. It's very rarely the case that you lose an initiative, but you still win. But in 2010, that initiative, was it Prop 19? Prop Prop 19, I, can't, I, I still lose track of the numbers now, all these initiatives. Um, that initiative, I think, it lost, but it won. Because it transformed the national dialogue. It transformed the national dialogue. And I'll tell you, I basically never thought it could win, with the exception of one week, the first week of October 2010, when the polling was still hanging up high. Normally you see the polling dive in October, but it's still hanging up there. I say, my God, this thing might do it. And then it did dive a week later. But nonetheless, I mean, I think Richard Lee deserves enormous credit for that initiative in terms of laying the groundwork and moving things forward with that. And laying out, laying out his own money to put that thing on the ballot in that way. It's also why in 2012, we did what we could to help the three strikes reform initiative here. It's also why in 2014, when Prop 47 was on the ballot to reduce incarceration and reduce the penalty for drug possession, you know, from a misdemeanor to a, from a felony to a misdemeanor and five other low-level offenses, it's why we helped with the drafting, helped with the campaign, helped with the fundraising as much as we could. And it's why ultimately, when I look at back last year and say, what am I proud about DPA in California? You know what I'm proud about? We've been fighting for years to end that crack powder disparity in California law. And we did it. We did it, a multi-year effort across the spectrum. We've been fighting for years to make sure that needle exchange programs are legal in California without any sunset provisions. And you know what? We did it. And you know what else we did last year? You know, I don't know how many of you know that last year more people died of a, of a, of a drug-related overdose involving heroin or pharmaceutical opiates than died in an auto accident. 
right? More. Number one cause of accidental death in America right now is accidental death from, from opioids, right? We, there's an antidote called naloxone, which if you give it to people and they overdose, it pops them right back up, right? We want to make that stuff easily, readily available. And California became the second state in the country to say, Naloxone, that antidote for an overdose, will now be available over the counter, over the counter in California pharmacies. None of that had to do with marijuana. But that's what we're about. It's about ending the drug war and about fighting for human rights and decency and good public policy, about advancing civil liberties and civil rights. And the reason why I feel so compelled for us to play a key role in the effort to legalize marijuana in 2016, the reason why I stood up at that normal conference two years ago and made a commitment that we are going to do that is because California has got to do it right. And as the people who are going to be affected by this are not just the people who are the patients in the industry and the growers, it's going to be all Californians who have anything to do with this. It's going to be people who care about the environmental depredations happening from illegal grows in state forests and elsewhere. It's going to be people who are worried about what's happening with the inner cities. It's going to be people who say, well, is it just going to be white people making this and that and white people making like, all that sort of stuff. It's going to be people worrying about losing their jobs, whether they've been growing quasi-legally gray market or distributing what have you. It's going to be people in public health and in drug treatment and the medical environment and even some people in law enforcement who can see their way to step out and break ranks right, and join with us who also care about this. It's going to be people who want to see some significant tax revenue come from this industry and see this thing be legally regulated in a responsible way. It's going to be about bringing everybody as much as we can, can, can logistically do to the table getting the best possible ideas out there and trying to put together the best, most far-reaching, most winnable, most implementable marijuana legalization initiative that this country has ever seen. That's what we're fighting for. <laughs> now let me tell you, let me hear now talk a little frankly about the dilemmas that are emerging, right? Because one of the things we find and I'll tell you something that's difficult. I fought always against the vested interests, those who have the vested interests in retaining prohibition. I fought against the prison industrial complex all my life. The people, the, pri the private prison corporations and the prison guards unions and the district attorneys associations and the cops and everybody else who's making a dime and, you know, wanting to keep more people behind bars in order to pad their overtime or, you know, legitimize their jobs or what whatever it might be. But you know what gets challenging? Is when a growing number of my allies and a growing number of people who I've oftentimes fought together with develop a vested interest in marijuana prohibition as well. That's hard because we don't have the same sorts of guiding principles to deal with that. When I looked at growers in Humboldt and Mendocino basically voting against uh, Prop 19 some years ago, and I understood, and you talk to some, they say, Ethan, look, you know, I mean, I agree with you about legalizing, but the fact of the matter is we're not going to be able to compete in a legal market once it goes, and I've got to protect my livelihood. Where's our guiding principles for dealing with that, right? We'd all been together before these issues got complicated saying, hey, we're fighting for essentially an alcohol model, right? An alcohol model. And as many of you heard me say, I'm not fighting for the Budweiserization or Marlboroization of marijuana. I'd like to see a microbrewery or vineyard model emerging in this state and many other places. <laughs> Right? That's my preferred model, okay? But what's our role? What is the obligation to protect and defend those players who have a vested interest in prohibition because they've thrived under prohibition as growers or distributors and are feared about the competition? And, you know, part of it is like my, and meanwhile, those are oftentimes the place where my heart is. But on the other hand, and then I look at other places and say, I went to this the cannabis business conference in Las Vegas, you know, uh, in November, and it's overwhelmingly people who, who, who have, you know, uh, who, who have never, uh, never been involved in this. The people who can be benefiting or profiting are people who never stuck their necks out, who don't have any core civil rights or civil liberties consciousness, right? Who often are looking for money, sometimes a quick buck, sometimes a long-term investment. Right? And I basically I mean, stood up there and I said, how many of you ever heard, about, heard of me before I stood up here? How many of you ever heard of Rob Campy before I stood up here? Less than half raised their hands. And I basically said, guys, I'm your fucking daddy and you don't even know it. <laughs> I said, I said you, think, you, think, you think these opportunities just fell off a tree? 
You think that California and then Alaska, Oregon, Washington, Colorado, Nevada, and Maine all legalized like out of thin air? You think it happened in New York, New Jersey, which had thin air? You think it was like some natural eruption, like somehow created opportunities? Let's go grab it. I said, you guys lie at a unique intersection in the history of American politics. Right? Because what this is right now is a movement that's been driven first and foremost by civil liberties and civil rights and keep people who care about public health and public policy and criminal justice reform and racial justice and human rights resulting in the transformation of emergence of a legal market that is going to be worth many tens of billions of dollars a year very soon. There is nothing else like that in the history of American politics. The movements for gay rights, civil rights, women's rights, those all had major economic consequences, but not the emergence of a brand new legal market. The repeal of alcohol prohibition, a little bit similar, but that essentially reinstituted a legal market that existed only 14 years before. We're talking about something unprecedented. And I said to the guys in the industry, that imposes an obligation on you. I say, when we're moving forward, you know, our first and foremost concern, first and foremost, is that human beings in this world, and especially ours, but human beings, should not be punished in any way for the possession or use of marijuana. That's our first, and that's where we start from. That is the fundamental human right. That secondly, that secondly, they should have the ability to get it from a source that is going to be responsible for the quality of the product that they are providing, right? That is second. That thirdly, thirdly, that to the maximum extent possible, people should be allowed to grow their own damn weed. That grow and be able to grow your own marijuana is something vital. I got to say, I'm a New Yorker. I don't have a green thumb. I can't fully connect to the kind of grow part of this, but I get it. I get it. You know, sometimes I think about, and I said this to the guys in the industry, I said, I think about the gun, the, 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 uh, the, the anti-gun control movement, the gun rights movement, right? And I say, you know, some of that's about the black helicopters are coming. Some of that's about what the Constitution says, right? But some of that, I actually think with guns, right, is almost that visceral, sensual element around holding that gun, that in your hand, it's almost, I don't want to say it's sexual, but I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's just something intimate about that. I don't get that either. I'm a New Yorker, but I get it. And the thing about marijuana being able to grow your own stuff, I get that one. It is pivotally important, and wherever we can include that, we need to do so. And I said to the industry folks, I said, when you're doing your initiatives, don't regard home grow as competition. How much are the people making a little beer or wine in their backyards competition for the big beer industry or anybody else, or even for the microbreweries, right? There's an ethical obligation. And you know what? I almost got a standing ovation from the industry for saying include home grow in the future, right? Now, that's something I think we can count bank and we do it, and we're going to do our best on that sort of stuff. So first question for you. What's our guiding principles when it comes to protecting those who've been involved in the industry, but you know, may not survive in a more competitive industry or won't be able to compete for those licenses? What does it mean? Well, Colorado, which had a statewide regulatory system, medical marijuana made it somewhat easy, right? But it was tougher in Oregon. It's going to be tougher in California. What does it mean to do that sort of thing? You can give preferences or do you give preferences? Or who does get preferences? There's another initiative out there where you know, whoever pays is going to get a preference. I, I don't like the idea of vested interest paying for certain provisions and interest. DPA does not lobby for the industry. We stand for human rights and good public policy. So then I'll tell you, you look at the other initiatives that have been out there, right? So a lot of times, DPA sometimes takes the lead, sometimes we follow, sometimes we, we, we play a whole variety of roles in all this sort of stuff, right? You know, if you want to know the initiatives, what, what happened, you think about what happened in, in uh, 2011, 2012, Colorado and Washington, right? In both cases, DPA did not initiate that. Right, you know, in Washington, it was initiated by ACLU, Allison Holcomb, folks like that. Graham Boyd, who had represented Peter Lewis, was very involved as well. Right, there were people locally involved as well, supporting that thing. Uh, Rick Steves will speak here tomorrow. Uh, a number of others, right? And then Colorado, driven by MPP and Steve Fox and and Brian Vicente, Christian Cederberg, a range of other Mason Twert, range of activists doing that, who had done that for a number of years. And so, I had a limited amount of money to raise had to make some judgment calls. The polling showed that Washington State had a better chance than Colorado, right till the very end, right, where they landed up being basically evil, even about 55%, right? 
Rob Campy was raising money for Colorado, right? They needed some, right? Washington State. And Washington State presented a dilemma. Because on the one hand, it contained two provisions which DPA would not write in. One was a ban on home grow, and the other one was a ridiculous drug testing requirement that was not grounded in the science, right? Right? So then we had to do an assessment. Well, how significant, right? We didn't have, we had almost no input on the drafting of that one, right? And we had, and then meanwhile, the drug testing thing was there. I basically got some of our key allies, people who did not like that provision, but also looked around the country at other states that also had these kind of zero you know, tolerance drug testing things. And it turned out that in most of those states, almost nobody was getting busted for that anyway. So it looked like it might be a symbolic provision that stuck in our craw, but that basically wasn't going to have that much impact on the ground. Meanwhile, it was a chance to pop a hole in prohibition nationally, right? And the situation presented itself. If I put up about a, th you know, thir a third of the money or so for Washington State, notwithstanding my reservations, that would leverage Peter Lewis and the in-state donors and enable a, a campaign of five, six million dollars to win that thing. And I, what I said is, yes. I'm going to put that money in there because even though I don't like some of these provisions, even though it may have problems in implementation, and even though we saw some of those things coming up ahead, we could pop a hole in prohibition because that was going to resonate across the country, lay the groundwork for California and other states, and have an even international impact, create the momentum. In Colorado, we were deeply involved in the drafting of that initiative. We were deeply involved on the ground game. We took the lead on advocating in terms of the racial justice elements of that piece. Right? And now we're involved in, because I had office there, on the implementation of that piece. Right? We put in some of the money, maybe 10% of the money, right? but that was our role in Colorado. Past year, in Oregon, right? in Oregon, well, basically, we got called in by activists saying, we want to do something here. You know, Travis Maurer had been a grower. He came in, we said, we want to wait till 2016. Right? Brought in Graham Boyd with me, who was you know, representing the same you know, interests of Peter Lewis and his family. And we said, but if the polling knocks our socks off, we'll consider going for 2014, right? The polling knocked our socks off. I realized in retrospect, it had been a blip. That the fall of 2013 was a blip in the polling. Because what had happened was, Washington and, 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 and Colorado had just had legalized. There was all that sense of momentum and possibility. Then Holder had come out with a memorandum in late August, and it, that meant that the feds were going to give this chance a chance to move forward. Everybody, polling was polling close to 60% nationally. Even in the South, you were getting to the high 40s or 50%. Oregon was way over 60%. And we, we were just saying, damn, wow, amazing. Then, of course, what happens, fast forward after we made the commitment about nine months later, and also the media is focusing on all the difficulties of implementation in Colorado and the nervousness and Maureen Dow's doing her wacko shit and sending out stuff and the edibles and a guy jumps off a roof. And I mean, you know, and, and all of a sudden, the polling starts to drop nationally in Oregon. And what I also knew was that the downside of losing in Oregon was greater than the upside of winning. Because people sort of expected Oregon to win, right? It's up there in the Northwest. It's liberal. It got so close with a poorly funded, not well drafted, you know, initiative a couple years before, right? But it got close even with that. And, but I'm thinking we've made this commitment now, right? And my biggest fear is overconfidence. People just think marijuana is going to legalize itself. What kind of dream world? Or can people think marijuana is going to legalize itself? People don't remember the late 1970s. I remember going to college in the late 70s. Oh yeah, marijuana is practically legal. Yeah, pow annual survey of college freshmen in 1979 showed 51% in favor of legalizing marijuana. Ten years later, 1989, 16%, right? Reagan revolution, conservatives, et cetera. I remember back in 2001, you know, after 9-11, all of a sudden, country becomes security obsessed and all this sort of stuff, and all of a sudden, our momentum dropped dramatically. I know that at any moment, some other environmental, you know, terrorist disaster could come flip the hell out of America again. Everybody tightens up, gets like this, wants to control, you know, and that's what could happen, right? But you know what? If we lost in Oregon, if we lost in Oregon, you know what? You know what that media, and regardless of what Alaska, you know, is an outlier, is important that it won, very important that it won, a red state winning for the first time. But if it had, Oregon had lost, we all go, oh, yeah, well, it won just natural evolution, right? Colorado, Washington, Oregon, Alaska, D.C., da, da, da. You know what would have happened if Oregon lost? What would have been the national headline the next day? 
Voters turn their back on marijuana legalization. Voters have second thoughts about legalization. Maybe Washington and Colorado are just outliers. Then maybe the Obama administration begins to back up because they don't feel the sense of inevitability anymore. Then our, our allies in Congress are less likely to be out there. And then all the states that have legalized medical begin to say, well, maybe we've got to pull back. And, then, and I'd be out there saying, well, well, wait a second, everybody. It was an awful, it wasn't a presidential election year. The numbers dropped because we didn't have the, you know, young people didn't turn out. We're still, the plan's still the same for 2016. All would have been true. But we would have been fighting an uphill battle. And I'll tell you this, if I hadn't raised over $2 million last year for Oregon, almost oh, a tiny fraction of it from people in Oregon, it would have lost. I think it would have lost. You know, these things don't legalize themselves, and it takes real money from people not just in the state and not just in the industry, because a lot of the people in the industry were not putting up real money on this stuff, and a lot of people in the industry, when they put the money up, they want to make sure they get their own little preferences in the whole damn thing, which I don't believe we should be doing as an organization that fights for human rights and good public policy, right? And then Alaska. Rob Campia calls me, asks for help. We're helping, where MPP's taking the lead, we're helping them draft those initiatives. And my deal with Rob is if we like the initiative that results, and if we like the campaign that's happening, and if I got some money to spare, I'll help. So we kicked in 100 grand Alaska in the final analysis, and that may have been what helped make it over the top. DPA didn't lead it, somebody else led it, but we were willing to help. DC, initiative got going with the support of David Bronner and Adam Eidinger, an activist in DC, but DC is 50% African American. And the polling we saw in the summer showed a majority of African Americans were opposed to this thing. So we partnered, we co-led that DC campaign, we took our entire ad budget, poured it into African American media. When that vote happened, over 60% of African Americans in DC voted in favor of that initiative, and both blacks and whites said that racial justice was the number one reason they voted to decriminalize slash legalize marijuana in DC. That's what we did. And you know what else? In Uruguay, when Uruguay decided to do this, and that president bravely said, what's the right thing to do? Within a month, I was sending my people down to help on the drafting, and then one of my people moved out of Uruguay for an entire year to coordinate the effort, the public education campaign among the Uruguayan government, the Uruguayan activists, and the consultants from the US and the experts from Europe in order to do the best possible thing. And I gotta tell you, the model they came up with, on the one hand, very low, pro very low tax price, on the other hand, hyper-government control, the stuff that makes you feel ill if you're an American, right? I mean, but nonetheless, we didn't control it. It was for the Uruguayans, this side, but we were going to help that model prevail as well, even though in the American context it looked very, very strange. Because ultimately, it had to be about ending marijuana prohibition. We are involved in a historic struggle right here, both about marijuana and more broadly. It means that we want the details of this thing to be as good as possibly can be, but it means we got to keep popping holes through the prohibitionist edifice. We have four states down and 46 to go. We have one country down and 197 or whatever it is to go. You know, when Jamaica started talking about it, I was down there twice meeting with the senior leadership. I went down there in December and I spoke to the Negril Chamber of Commerce and I said to those guys, if you don't get your shit together, you're going to be importing ganja from America before you know it. That was, I got to tell you, that made national, that made national headlines in Jamaica. And I don't know if it was my saying that, but the very few weeks later, the government announced, the cabinet announced its own far-reaching decriminalization in Jamaica. Religious right, medical right, you can bring your California ID to Jamaica and it'll be legitimate there, ending the criminalization of possession, okay? I mean, we're playing... So that is what we're trying to do. I'll also say this. When I go and speak at conferences of people dealing with pain, the nurses and the doctors and the industry involved in the pain medication area, most of them involving in opioids and things like that, and I say to them, how many of you are aware fully of the medical literature and the medical value of marijuana and pain? And how many of you are recommending it? And only 10 or 20% raise their hands? They get an admonishment and a lecture from me where I say that they are not fulfilling their ethical obligation as caretakers, as physicians, as nurses by remaining ignorant of that, the medical benefits of marijuana. When you have research out there showing that marijuana can substitute for certain types of opiates and that if you combine the two, you can significantly reduce the amount of opiates you take and that one reason we may be seeing overdoses dropping in the most robust medical marijuana states is because of that. How can you in good conscience not be a physician and not know this and not be recommending this? And the next day I go and speak at a cannabis convention. And I hear people standing up there and saying, 
damn the opiates. Those things will kill you. They'll addict you. They'll do all these terrible sorts of things. Marijuana is the answer here. And you know what I say? Shut the hell up already. Yes, marijuana is safer. Yes, you can't die of an overdose. Yes, it's not addictive in the way that opioids are. But there are all sorts of pain for which marijuana is not the answer and for which opioids, variety of opioids, are the answer, whether it's going through surgery and other sorts of intense pain or what have you. This is not about beating up one or the other. When people in the marijuana field, right, sometimes go to normal conferences, and normal doesn't say this, but others there would be doing it, you know, we got we to gotta legalize marijuana so we can crack down on the other drugs. As Carl Hart said early, no, 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 no. We are not going to legalize marijuana so we can crack down on people using heroin or meth or coke or whatever it might be. We are not going to do that. And when I go and talk to the psychedelics gatherings, I say, listen, I'm with you guys. I agree. When it comes to the upside-downside ratio, psychedelics is unparalleled, even relative to marijuana. When it comes to transformative experience, psychedelics, go, baby, go, you know? I mean, look at that piece Michael Pollan in New Yorker, you know, uh, uh, last week, that amazing piece. Now, there's an interview with him about the medical benefits and spiritual benefits of this stuff. But I say, do not, do not elevate our sacred and wonderful psychedelics above all the others. Because when we speak about the core human right involved here, just as the freedom of speech ultimately cannot distinguish in principle between ugly, racist, horrible speech and the speech that is most elevated, that on some level in a free society, in a First Amendment society, we have to acknowledge the rights of both of those things because we don't want to empower the government to be the one that choose. The same thing that when it comes to our personal sovereignty over our own minds and bodies, even though those may be more elevated, those may be more helpful, those may be less addictive, those may be more dangerous, we cannot insist or defend a governmental distinction or discrimination between those substances and those substances, between those people who use those and those people who use that. That's what it means to fight for human rights in a free society. So now, now I got to wonder here. So in Nevada, there can be an initiative, MPP taking the lead as helping on drafting, but where a preference may be given to alcohol distributors. We know one thing that could kill marijuana legalization is if alcohol folks decide they want to kill it because they got the money to kill what we're doing. Let's not tease ourselves about that. I don't think we need to be putting ourselves in their face. We can say what's true, which is marijuana is less dangerous than alcohol for most people, but no. But on the other hand, if there's a preference, I can see people who've been involved in medical marijuana growing should maybe get a preference for when it comes to the next level, right? But people who are putting money in for their own for-profit interests, I don't know, creates a dilemma. And then, we got the Ohio dilemma, right? You've been following this? Okay, so you know what's happening in Ohio right now. So in the fall, I get a call that there are 10 financial interests, business interests, who are each going to be putting in a total of $20 million to legalize marijuana in Ohio. Pretty impressive, right? I like the sound of this at first guess. Then it turns out what they're going to do is a constitutional initiative that is going to put into the Ohio Constitution that only the 10 business interests that paid for this will get to be involved on the wholesale side. Right? That's what it's happening. Okay? There's a few qualifiers that if they don't live up to what they're supposed to do in terms of being in the market, then it can be changed, et cetera. But that's what it's about. So I look at this thing, and they're following the model that was used with casinos. That's what's happened with casinos, as I understand it, with initiatives, whatever, is you write it in to favor the preferences. And they ask for our help on this thing. Now, what I know is if we don't offer any help, then it's going to happen without the EPA being involved at all. We're just you know, sidelines, and they'll do what they're going to do. If we do provide help, we can make this a stronger, tighter initiative, and it gives us an opportunity to at least try to get them to embrace some of our principles, some of our ways of thinking about this. And this group is somewhat attentive. It's a bipartisan group. They're somewhat attentive. They care about what DPA thinks. They care about these broader issues. There's some ethical conscience wa wavering in this group here, right? So then I say, we reach a deal. Okay, we will help you with the drafting. 
right? They already had their draft, but then we're going to help improve it and get our values into this thing. You cannot say that DPA helped, that therefore that implies an endorsement, because we are not at this point going to endorse this thing, right? We're not going to be out there opposing you either. We want to see how this thing plays out, right? So, and, and you know, basically we're going to promise not to do any he said, she said on this thing, but anybody who knows what DPA stands for is going to know what was in that initiative is consistent with what we stand, believe and what we don't, you know, what we don't believe, right? So now the initiative is out, and it's beginning to get some play there. And so here's the dialogue. Here's what I go on. I say, okay, if this thing doesn't move forward or if it fails, marijuana is going to remain illegal in Ohio for many, many years to come. There were 10 to 12,000 marijuana arrests a year last year for marijuana possession in Ohio. And as everywhere else, it's racially disproportionate, right? This initiative wins, and it will now be legal to possess up to an ounce. Most of those arrests are going to go away. And isn't that the fundamental about what we're fighting for? The human right not to be punished for what you put in your body and to possess marijuana, et cetera, et cetera, right? Then I say, but this damn thing sticks in my craw. I mean, 10 business interests kind of dominating this thing. Then I say, you know, I'll tell you something. We were deeply involved in legislative efforts in New Jersey and New York, and then there was the one in Massachusetts we weren't as involved in. In each one of those things, although we fought for a broader approach, in the final legislative compromise that resulted, it's only a limited number of business interests anyway that are going to get licenses. So maybe it's not that different. Then I say, but this one's written in the Constitution. It's that much harder to change. But then I say, <laughs> but this one actually, it limits the wholesale but it's got special protections for medical patients in there. They're very sensitive on that score. And it's not, it's not as well drafted as it needs to be on that side, but it, there's something in there. And it's going to open up tens of thousands, if not more, legal jobs. Because on distribution and on everything else, that's going to be open licenses. There's going to be up to 1,500 licenses for sale in Ohio. I mean, it's going to be a pretty open thing. It's going to bring a lot above the ground. It's going to open up a lot of legal jobs. People are not going to get arrested for possession. But damn, a mono, an oligopoly essentially, 10 business interests, right? Well, then I think, so is there any other alternative Ohio? There have been activists in Ohio for a long time. I mean, for a while, I stayed totally out of Ohio because it seemed like there were seven activists and 12 lawsuits going on. I couldn't keep them all straight, right? Now there seem to be much more credible people doing stuff, but I don't see where they're going to get the money. And I've made my commitment on California. That's going to be a monumental. We want to try to raise $15 million at least. We don't know if there's going to be opposition. We don't know if Sheldon Adelson is going to decide to play here like he did in Florida. We don't know what's going to happen there. We have to be prepared for what could come down the pike. We cannot assume there's not going to be funded or organized opposition against us. That would be silly and naive and irresponsible on our part. And I can't get any, raise any funding for this thing if people think we're going to be silly or naive about that sort of stuff, right? So then I'm thinking, you know, so the fact of the matter is, and I was talking to one of the activists there a couple of days ago, and I said, listen, I mean, I don't like this oligopoly thing either, but are, you going to, are the activists who have fought all their lives to end marijuana prohibition going to oppose an initiative because it's got an oligopoly on the supply side, even though it's going to open everything else up and give some protections to patients? And, and by the way, not they won't legalize home grow, but they're not going to ban home grow, so home grow can be introduced at some point, anything that's not banned in there, and there is a commission that can review this stuff. What's the... That's the dilemmas we're facing now. And then I got an email this morning hearing about another state where I don't see any real money coming for legalization that's looking at the Ohio model. And as far as I can tell, they want to repeal Michigan's medical marijuana. They don't want to have any, they want to ban home grow in the, in the, in the whole initiative. What I see is what we've unleashed now is for-profit interests, big business interests with no connection to this movement are lining up to see what they're going to do about that. And so I go back to my DPA set of principles and I go, is there guidance here for this? And the answer is not really, not fully. Because our own original principles say we, we, we advocate for drug policies grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights. That we are first and foremost concerned about the rights of people to consume and to possess. And as long as that's protected, that's our basis, right? Secondly, about the right of access to legally, so legally liable, that's protected in these oligopolistic things. Thirdly, the right of people to grow their own. Well, no. That one in, in Ohio is at least is not banned, but it may, it may open up down the road someplace else. And I'm thinking, how much longer do we all, activists or Drug Policy Alliance or anybody else, have a chance to actually influence the shape of this thing? 
I talked to a couple of the guys who are running the kind of trade associations, both of whom grew up within the marijuana reform movement, and they say to me, Ethan, you know, at this point, there's still a fusion. I mean, this conference is a model for that, of activists and, 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 and business interests, right? You know, and, it's, and, and they'll still have me or Rob or other people come and speak, or, or they'll have Ben Cohn from Ben & Jerry's talk about ethically responsible investing. But these guys say to me, our successors in the industry interests probably won't come from within the movement. Basically, what we are unleashing to some extent is basically an end to marijuana prohibition which is going to be increasingly driven by corporate interests who want to favor their way. And we're going to need to sort of reorganize our core principles around how we deal with this stuff. Because in the end, when I look at the oligopolies, I'm saying, they're doing most of what I want for my core principles, but there's something wrong with it. And I don't like where this thing is going. That's the realities of what we're dealing with now, right? If we don't do this right in 2016, and even if we do, there's a chance that those same forces could come here to California in subsequent years and try to do the same thing again. Better we lock in the best possible, most persuasive, most publicly backed, win by the biggest margin initiative right now, because if this initiative, we win an initiative and it's not responsible, not good, and all of a sudden oligopolistic interests come in and want to do something that's like that, tightly regulated, and then I, they could win. They could beat what we just won. And then I think, you know, I mean, Right? When I look at the polling, what do I, and when I look at government, when I look at this, I say, who's got the biggest money to put in this? I've raised almost all my money from people, the Soros, Peter Lewis, John Sperling, George Zimmer, other people who cared about this either from the left or right because of core principles of civil rights, civil liberties, good governance, health, security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the real money to win marijuana legalization is going to come from vested interests who want to monopolize the wholesale side of this sort of stuff, right? Well, you know, and you know what else I know? That for that swing voter in the middle, they don't care about, they care a little bit about the rights of patients, what we see. I mean, they, that, that moves them, right? But they don't care about the interests that people have been producing in the gray market or quasi-legal medical marijuana. They don't care about that sort of stuff. You know what the swing voter most wants, the person we need to get, that quintessential, you know, 40-year-old, 50-year-old soccer mom from Southern California or that Latino, you know, a parent who's kind of on the edge about this stuff, the people we need to get. You know what they define legalization as? Control. For them, it means control. They see prohibition is out of control, and part because of the work we've done, they sometimes see the whole California medical marijuana thing is out of control. And L.A., you know, L.A. was wide open and beautiful, but you want to know something? The images out of Los Angeles set back the progress of the legalization of medical marijuana around the country by probably what adds up to hundreds of years. When my folks are in the, in the, in the halls of Albany and Trenton, states around the country, and MPB's out there, the number one thing we've had to deal with, the number one thing that pushed us back and caused us to have to come back year after year after year was images of Los Angeles up, this is the face of medical marijuana. And we say, well, wait, look at the other state, look at Colorado, look at New Mexico, look at this. But that image, right, we got to do this thing right. We got to do this thing right. That swing voter is not going to care about the, a lot of things that we care about as a matter of principle from a human rights perspective or from the gray market protection interests, right? It's going to come by their wanting control. And you know, the people in the government, what are people in government going to want? They're going to want the oligopoly too. Because from their perspective, the fewer the number of providers, the fewer the number of growers, even the fewer the number of distributors, the more big, above-ground, legally regulated interests you have, the easier to regulate. It becomes a much more significant regulatory, much easier regulatory challenge. And if to some extent that is knocking out the black market to some good extent, well, then they're going to like that too. We got to be real about this. We got to be very real about this. So, you know, I'm coming up on this thing. I'm looking at 2016. I don't know what's going to go beyond. You know, MPP's taking a lead in, in Maine and uh, Nevada, Massachusetts, Arizona. We're helping draft. We'll see how that's going to shake out. Already there's battles brewing in those states over key provisions or things like that. I'm trying to figure out which battles are driven by substance and which are driven by ego. Right? I'm trying to figure out to what extent do I have an obligation, does DP have an obligation to defend the vested interests who benefit on the marijuana side, not the enforcement side, from the perpetuation of prohibition. These are the dilemmas we're trying to deal with. 
right? So what I can say about California 2016 is the EPA is committed to raising as much of that 15 or $20 million budget as we possibly can. It is my number one fundraising priority in California and around the country, it is. We are committed to making this process as absolutely as inclusive as possible. If people want to be drafting a whole bunch of other initiatives and getting their best ideas and building consensus with the communities, we want to know it and we want to hear it, right? If anybody wants to come to me and say, you think we can win anything in California, damn the polling, I say, okay, I'm not listening to you. If anybody comes up to me and says, all you guys care about is the polling, well, fuck you. Because we're an organization driven by human rights who has led this battle in many ways around the country for a very long time as well. Okay? And you know what else? There are people involved in the environmental community who care about what's going on. There are people who care about civil rights and civil liberties who care about this. There are people in the unions who are willing to support this stuff and care about this. There are well-meaning entre entrepreneurs who want to put money and support the broader vision and they care about this. There are polit polit political elected officials who care about this. There are thoughtful people working in California government who care about this. There are people in drug treatment and, and, and in public health who care about this. They all have to get a seat at the table. They all deserve a voice as Californians and as Americans who want to do what's right for California, who want to win the best possible initiative that we can win, that goes as far as possible, that's as protected as possible, that serves the patients, that serves the consumers, that represents a model for the rest of the country. That's my commitment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm pleased everybody helped. Do we have time for questions? We have time for some questions. So what I, what, my what I was going to oh, suggest go. is, let, how much time do we have all told? Like nine minutes. Why don't we take five, five or six questions, five questions together, and I'll answer them as, as a group. group. Okay, I have my question first. Okay. It's a very Whoa. simple question. She's in the prerogative. Okay. Can you remind your friends in suits that we are all outlaws to begin with, and if they pass regulations that don't work, it's not really going to have any effect? on the market and the things that we do. That's my question. Okay. Yeah. You guys, people act like California. No, no, there's Marijuana there's doesn't hands. need the weed. California needs the weed. You. Oh, right. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, Michael Allaire, West Coast Member Services. We're a small collective, and I'm looking at the number that we all know of 100, uh, 1.4 billion revenue in this state. We're not even a percentage of that, or even a percentage of a percentage. But here's a commitment that I'm, I'm going to make for us right now. Every budget that we create, every conversation we have with partners in our collectives, every financing entity that we work with now and comes to us in the future, a dedicated line item in our budget will be money for MPP and DPA. We're, we're Thank you very in. much. And, and I invite, Thank you. And, 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 and I want to be clear, it, it is the human, it is the human and civil liberties principles that we stand for. But I also want to be clear, I have self-interest. I want to work in an industry where all the things you just talked about are in fact the environment that I'm working in. My partner and I, are. this partnership is built on okay. principle. Sorry, so okay. I want you to know that that's, what we're, that's, what's, that's okay. what we're gonna do and I invite everybody Thank here you. to consider Thank you very that. much. Thank you very much. Let's, let's, try to, let's try to keep it to questions, please. This is the question and answer period. Thank you. Two questions real quick. Um, the the uh, ol oligopoly that you're talking about, couldn't that be voided by lawsuit after it's established um, and, and allow other uh, entities to enter the market? And the second is, um, have you considered that we might be able to sell uh, protecting the children to Californians by excluding the alcohol, tobacco, and pharmaceutical industry from a 2006 initiative and thereby allow our locals to get a market share for a year or two while we test it in court and beat it? Or they beat us. Uh, I understand. Indian tribes, America's most tragic human rights. There are 565 tribes and, and a good majority are considering opening up their lands to regulation of marijuana. What's your advice for the tribes? Yeah. Okay, like two more and then, oops, sorry. Hey, uh, you did great by the way. Uh, my name is Matt Wilson, uh, owner of stayhighlypositive.com. I'm also a farmer up in Northern California. I've been uh, working in the industry for four years in this gray area, I call it, 
And I just want to know from your um, from your brain what I can do uh, with all these guys up in the woods that are afraid of, you know, I'm not going to be able to feed my kid. What can I go back and tell these guys when I go back up the hills to make them feel comfortable where the direction is going and how they can help out in their community and help spread the positive word about cannabis? And thank you very much. You're awesome. Thank I love you. the energy. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, quick question for uh, 2014. There were about four competing initiatives. Uh, and what, uh, what our office tried to do is to get them together to uh, coalesce around one. We were unable to do that because of differences, whether it was ego or principles. As a result, none of them got funding. None of them made it onto the ballot. I was wondering how uh, you can help deal with that in 2016 so that doesn't happen again. Yeah, good question. Okay, I think that's probably four or five. I'm sorry, you guys. You can do one or – I think we have time for one or two more. Okay, all right, we'll do this one, and then we'll do Chris, and then that'll be it. Thanks, Ngaio. Um, Ethan, uh, you talk about raising $15 million to legalize marijuana in California. There's a gentleman who just wrote a $75 million check to San Francisco General Hospital. His name was Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, how are you going to get Silicon Valley on board to legalize cannabis in California? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I just wanted, uh, this is Chris Conrad, I just wanted to say thanks, great speech, uh, but also the, when we talk about Northern California, uh, we have to be careful that it doesn't sound like all of Northern California turned against Prop 19 or anything like that, because there was like, you know, really pretty close up there, we were within a four or five percentage difference, and so uh, my question is just is how do we create a dialogue that keeps the people who supported us while we're winning the people who were not uh, so favorable? Thank you. Okay. 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 Well, thank you for those comments and questions. So let me um, let me make the following ones. Um, first of all, the Mark Zuckerberg thing. My understanding is that Mark Zuckerberg's just not into this. Um, but some of the other Facebook guys, uh, Sean Parker and uh, Dustin Moskowitz, have been supporting DPA in a modest, not so modest way. Um, so I'm optimistic that we can reach into Silicon Valley. Some of those guys got behind Prop 47, the initiative of sensory reform one last year. So I think we will make some inroads into this stuff as well. And there are people outside California. Remember, when, you know, I mean, you go back to Prop 215, the way that happened, Prop 215 would not have happened if Dennis Perone and a number of others had not gotten together and got drafted that initiative. That was the first step. If they hadn't done that, I wasn't jumping in in California in 96. And you know what then happened? I get a call in the fall from, from Ed Rosenthal, uh, uh, you know, uh, saying, Ethan, you got to help. You know, we're close. You got to help. And I say, well, I, I called Dennis. I say, Dennis, you want any help? He said, no, we want to do this an activist thing. He said, okay, hung up. A month later, Ed calls me back again. He says, Ethan, Ethan, what happened? I, we really need your help. I said, Dennis said he didn't want to help. I said, call him again. He goes, I called Dennis. Dennis says, yeah, we'd like your help. We'd like your help, you know? Okay, come in. And, you know, Ed's saying we owe $50,000. Huh? Uh, we look at it, and it turns out, you know, you need 700,000, 435,000 qualified signatures, 700,000. There were 35,000 signatures collected, right? It wasn't going anywhere. And then it became a chance of raising money. George Zimmer stepping up as the one California in-state donor, when I was able to go to George Soros and Peter Lewis and then John Sperling and say, match this guy, and then go to other guys from outside California. So people outside California care about this happening. They understand the importance. The money's going to come from outside the state and inside. What I would say, you know, on the issue of the Indian tribes, very interesting there, because, you know, that, that really remarkable uh, directive that came out from the Justice Department a few months ago saying the Indian tribes got the right to move forward in this area. Absolutely spectacular. And already the tribes are meeting. One of my colleagues, Amanda Ryman, has been, I think, going to one of those meetings. I'll tell you something else really interesting in Alaska. Even though all of the senior Native American leadership up there and the casinos folks up there oppose marijuana legalization, the marijuana legalization in Alaska won a majority of the Native American vote up there because there is a generational split happening within Native American communities, certainly in Alaska and I assume everywhere else. And younger people understand that marijuana is not booze, it is especially not booze in a Native American context, that it is different, it is different. So I think that the more the Native American you know, tribes can get involved in this and hopefully not get involved, 
in opposing, because sometimes the Native American you know, vested interests in the state have put in money against some of our reforms from a very conservative cultural place, and I, I, sometimes because they're in partner with the wrong sorts of people. So I think we need to keep the, the, the big Native American money from coming in against us, appeal as much as possible to younger generation, and encourage them to be stepping up. Without them, of course, what happens then as with casinos, then they start to oppose anybody else having it. So we need to avoid those kind of vested interests as well growing up there. But I think at this point we want the more the merrier in a responsible way on that front. I'd say, you know, Matt Wilson with respect to the guys in the woods and Chris Conrad's point about, um, about, about what do you say, it's tough. I mean, it's like if I in a previous life was involved in trying to end alcohol prohibition, what was I going to say to the guys with the backyard stills in Kentucky and Tennessee and everywhere else growing some booze and making some money about repealing alcohol prohibition? Right, because if those guys had looked at it, probably some of them did, they say, hey, we love to drink. We also love prohibition because that's how we're making our money, right? So at some point, one has to say, we can't guarantee for all the growers up there. And as Chris said, roughly half the people up there did, in fact, support legalization, right? The opposition came from growers who like marijuana but opposed the reform and from people who were anti-marijuana, right? I think a lot of this comes down to going back to basic principles. Can you, in good faith, vote to continue with marijuana prohibition in this state? Can you continue with that? Marijuana is being decriminalized. Now people are getting infractions, but there's still a lot of people getting infractions all around this state. And once again, it is overwhelmingly young men of color who are getting nailed for this stuff. Can you, in good faith, defend that? There are all sorts of people around this state who don't live in a medical marijuana friendly jurisdiction. They're having a hell of a time. Can you, in good faith, defend that? There is litigation in the courts that could start screwing this stuff up. You got Fresno banning home grow. You got stuff going on. There's states, there's lawsuits by other states as well. You know, this stuff, the people say, hey, we want to protect what we got. One thing you got to remember that what we got in California today is inherently unstable. There's going to be new people in the White House two years from now, and I don't see anybody on the horizon with a really good chance. I mean, you want to say Rand Paul's got a good chance, but apart from that, who's going to be, uh, you know, as sympathetic as Obama and Holder have been on this sort of stuff, right? There is the risk of a backlash. There is the risk of litigation going the wrong way and the Supreme Court coming down the wrong way. I looked when I remember going back to, uh, to Montana in the middle, middle part of the last decade, and people were going, hey, man, it's open. People were uh, conventions in hotels. First time I ever saw, like, marijuana plants in a hotel conference hall, like in 2000. 2006 or something, right? And Montana almost got wiped out by the change in political parties and the popular rejection of that stuff getting out of hand, right? I want many of you to remember that when we won Prop 215, a month later, the federal drug czar stood up with the head of HHS and other agencies and the head of NIDA, and they basically said, you know, we're going to go after any doctor who recommends marijuana and maybe patients. And DPA, together with Grant Boyd and the ACLU, sued their butts in federal court. We got a temporary restraining order, a preliminary injunction. We won in federal court. We won an appeals court. And we won the constitutional First Amendment right to discuss medical marijuana. You know something? In fact, I'll tell you. The, I had time. Sweetest contribution I ever got was a $325,000 check from the federal drug czar's office reimbursing us for our attorney's fees in that case. Right? So, yes. you know, the, 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 the last point I want to say is, is the following. You know, I also want, one other thing I want to say is, Two years ago, DPA, together with a few others, made a rapid-fire attempt to sort of get an initiative on the ballot in 24, at least to draft one, right? We knew going in, the odds were against us even going to collect the signatures. We knew it would be our money. And I want to, you know what, what I know is that that effort generated a lot of distrust. And I want to apologize for that. Because quite frankly, at that moment, I was looking, I was saying, the polling is rock hard right now. It's going to be crazy in 2016. You never know what's going to happen. Let's seize the moment, you know. And we said, let's draft this thing. And then we said, no. It needed to be a more participatory process. It needed to be in a whole other way. So I apologize. To those of you who were freaked out and weirded out by what DPA did, I want to apologize. That is not what is going to happen this time. We are going to make this process as inclusive as possible. Listen to any good idea on the table. And guys, please, California, it's not just about California. It's primarily, I know, for here, but for the nation. When I go to Mexico and I say, what will change the situation in Mexico where 100,000 people have been killed in these drug wars? You know what people say to me? Legalize marijuana in California. And I say, what about Washington, Colorado? They go, that helped. What about Oregon, Alaska? That helped. 
Legalize it. If you go in Texas, even better, but you can't do it there. Legalize it in California. So let's do it right. I hope I can all count on your support, and we'll be as, in a good faith place on here. Ethan Nadelman. Ethan Nadelman. One more time. Ethan Thank Nadelman. Thank you very much.